This signature sound is a trademark, not only in Hollywood, but especially in the African wilderness. It is inseparably connected with this landscape and belongs to one of its greatest stars. But like with most other big cats, lions are currently undergoing the most difficult time in their evolutionary history. Even in South Africa, where much is being done to protect these animals, especially lions and cheetahs are having a tough time. There's no utopia where animals are operating on their own in their own utopia. As long as humans are around, humans are going to have some sort of influence in nature. And if we're not seeing them and conserving them and understanding them, we end up losing it. Just as lions have disappeared from much of their former range, even in these few remaining areas, their survival is questionable in many places. while cheetahs are even worse off. Only in southern Africa their numbers stay reasonably stable at around 4,000 animals. As with all big cats, however, these estimates are unreliable. In some places where they have long since been extinct, a surprising comeback is achieved with the help of committed wildlife biologists. So we use this antenna just to track our cheetahs. The way that they work is they are a directional antenna, so we'll point, point it in a direction and if the cheetah is in that direction it should pick up the signal coming from the collar that the collars that they have on has both a satellite signal that it sends through which gives me a GPS coordinate once a day and the telemetry so it's a very high frequency collar which sends me a signal so he's, gonna, he's gonna make his way back up The three main reasons why cheetahs struggle in the wild, firstly it would be human wildlife conflict, especially in southern Africa. We have a lot of farmers that end up uh, not wanting predators on their properties and removing them in different manners. And then also lions, lions kill cheetahs, they are their greatest predator. And then the third would actually be the illegal pet trade. Cheetahs as pets? For centuries there has been a tradition with Asian cheetahs for this in the Middle East. They only still exist in Iran today. Now their African conspecifics are on the wish list. He used to come chasing after you, which is not normal for a cheetah. Cheetahs don't normally want to threaten people. Uh, that's why they're so easy to have on a reserve and actually approach on foot as well. 
uh, but he is a little bit of a cheeky boy. Ecologists believe that cheetahs that were once held in captivity can't be easily released in freedom. Jolandi disagrees and is passionate about reintroducing cheetahs into the wild. I think it's very important to, to take these animals that are in captivity and release them into the wild. These animals, even though they don't know predators like lions or hyenas, uh, they can be taught to hunt for themselves, they can be taught to be free. So especially in, in an environment where one third of our total population is in captivity, taking these animals into the wild, we can increase the wild genetic population by doing this. The offspring of those captive cheetahs can be wild and can go into an area where there are other predators. And that's easier said than done as the wilderness and therefore the habitat for all animals has disappeared together with the big cats. He had never really hunted until he came here. So when, once he was introduced to our reserve itself, he actually started off by hunting ostriches and then he slowly learned to start hunting impalas and now he hunts no more ostriches and only impalas. <laughs> He's learning, he's adapting to this environment. We've got lots of hills here, which does make hunting a little more difficult for them, but he does quite well. We introduced about 20 impalas and uh, he's hunted about four of them already. So they, we should still have 16 impalas running around, which he just needs to find and hunt. The wilderness in the foreground of the picture, the farmland of the Western Cape in the back. Zebras were the first animals to return to the Gondwana game reserve a decade ago. Big cats are the latest arrivals on this Noah's Ark. Extensive investments were unavoidable, not only for the animals, but also the human neighbor's safety. Fences are essential in keeping people out of the environment where the wildlife is. So when you're putting up a fence, the animals stay on the one side and they're able to hunt, they can do what they need to do and the people can stay on the other side and do what they need to do and there's no conflict between the two. Lions first. Not often do traffic signs bear such a strong symbolism. Only wild animals are allowed to roam freely inside the fenced area. Tourists are restricted to these driving cages. The same goes for the much larger Kwandwe game reserve in the Eastern Cape province, where, like in Gondwana, farmland was transformed back into natural landscapes. Historically, this particular area, the Great Fish River Valley, was one of Africa's great wildlife areas. But over the past 200 years, the animals had all been locally extinct. So there were no elephants, there were no rhino, lion, buffaloes, all those types of animals. We had to bring all those animals in. So first of all, it took a process of clearing and rehabilitating the land and then bringing all the animals back. For the endangered black rhinoceroses, even the smallest spot on earth is some kind of life insurance. They are much more endangered than lions, pretty much about the same threat level as cheetahs. The mundane law that man gives and man takes applies to the habitat of wild animals. In most places in Africa, mankind claims more and more space for itself. South Africa is an exception. Since the end of apartheid, the habitat for big cats has increased, even though these areas are zoned. They are basically islands for wildlife. <coughs> <coughs> A lot of people in the world that had this utopian view that you know wildlife must just be allowed to roam freely and sort of go anywhere where they want to but they don't take into account that there are just far too many human beings on the planet 
And the fences mean that the cat populations have to be managed. You know, you have a lot of pastoral subsistence farmers and you've got lions eating their cattle. And then the retribution is that those lions will be poisoned or killed. Kwandwe is about three times the size of Gondwana, covering around 300 square kilometers. This is big enough for cheetahs to behave naturally, even though they don't have it easy with that many lions. The last time there were cheetah in our area was in 1888. The last two males, known males, were shot on a farm probably about 20 miles from our northern border. So to have played a role in bringing cheetah back into this area, in 2001 we introduced our first populations. You know, they talk about the cheetahs being the least adapted animal, and we found them that they adapted to this environment very, very quickly, and their prey base was not what we thought it was going to be. I can safely say that we have moved at least 20 cheetah off this property to establish or supplement other populations. I think cheetah within our province actually have contributed well to the national population. Only few young animals can cause similar feelings in humans as cheetah cubs. But this has little effect on their high mortality rate, which is rather caused by man than lions. If the cheetah mother is killed, the little ones are helpless. I actually watched the mother of those cubs grow up from small little things the first time. That's why it was so wonderful and exciting to see the ones I watched grow up to have their first litter or their second litter of cubs now and the cubs are doing well. It was incredible. And the fact that there's nine is even more mind-blowing. So two sisters with a litter each, is that's a first for me on this reserve. And so all the other predators like lions, leopards, and even the smaller things like jackals and the hyenas, if anything finds the cubs, they'll kill them. It's just if the scent gets too strong in certain areas, she'll start moving into different areas. By constantly moving them around, she also tries to keep them safe like that. It's no longer about the fate of an individual, but the survival of the entire species. With only 7,000 cheetahs worldwide, this species is close to extinction. Their survival in particular reserves depends on human interference. Too many lions that are very popular with tourists reduce the survival chances of cheetahs. Lion populations in our country are growing, particularly on private land. Now, if you talk about Africa's lion population on that end, it's declining, and we could look to supply lions into the rest of Africa. But one obviously needs to make sure that the reason for the decline in the populations in other areas needs to be dissolved. Otherwise, you're just pouring into an area where they may be killed or poached again. Lions, cheetahs and black rhinos are constantly observed in Kwandwe. It's not about disrupting their interactions. The rangers are rather urged never to intervene in the animal's natural behavior, even if lions were to kill a whole litter of cheetahs. However, the reserve's management makes sure that the different species are kept in balance. We can't let our lion population get too high. There is a carrying capacity to where they start diminishing the prey base. So one needs to manage these populations and for genetic purposes as well. So we moved um, two lions up to Medikwe when they were around two to three years old. They were chasing the rhinos and things like that. They were just behaving like teenagers. It's not unusual. But when they got up there, they killed a young elephant. So they became quite infamous or famous. I'm not sure which one. 
In Madikwe, this hunting behavior even met the interests of nature conservation as elephants became too numerous and therefore a threat to the habitat. All predators are quite important, especially because they keep your prey species, keep the numbers down, because if your prey species, like the antelopes, the populations get too high, they've got a massive negative impact on the vegetation, and especially warthogs as well, lions eat a lot of warthogs. Nature can no longer provide a natural balance. Borders, fences and roads prevent the crucial migration of many animal species. The open spaces of African nature films are slowly turning into a myth. Land ownership is a political issue everywhere in Africa, especially in the former apartheid state of South Africa. A lot of the time, the state will perceive us as big landowners. You know, land is contentious in Africa. We need land to have megafauna. You can't have breeding herds of elephant on a square inch of land. You need big land. And we're expanding those frontiers of conservation, which is very, very important, particularly for the carnivores. To have these areas where you have almost a genetic resource of the animal for the national parks around Africa. It's really a two-way street. You have to have the conservation and you need the tourism to pay for it. And the one can't really do without the other. So it's a balance between the two. They need each other nowadays. And I think that's evident in Africa. But even the much vaunted ecotourism is no cure-all. It depends less on the packaging than on content and quantity. At first glance, helicopter flights seem incompatible with ecological awareness, but they are often crucial for the effective monitoring of an area when it comes to poaching. The same goes for the rangers and trackers, who immediately pass on any suspicious perception even if their actual main task is a different one. Trackers, most important thing on the vehicle, because they sit on the front, there's no way possible where a ranger can do all the work with talking with the guests, look around where you're driving and find all the animals. They've never met people that can spot animals as far as the trackers do and see tracks the way trackers do. The trackers are by far not as vulnerable as the anti-poaching units, without which no reserve can do. But their job is certainly dangerous too. You follow lion tracks, you need to put on your mind that you you're going to be charged by lions and you fall in there and you're going to disturb them. So when walking, you're not just going to follow the tracks and look down. You need to look around as well. Poaching is one of the biggest concerns these days. It takes advantage of rural poverty to make real profits overseas. The fight against the poachers is like a fight against windmills. The causes of poaching, especially the poverty in rural areas, must be eliminated. Now we look at nature conservation playing a role in what we term the wildlife economy. And we start seeing the importance of communities in, in nature conservation. We start seeing the importance of not just the big iconic animals of Africa, but the soil, the water. I've always believed that nature conservation starts with people. And if people are deriving a benefit from a wildlife area, from a protected area, then you are taking the first step. That absolute foundation stone of conservation is making sure that people are included and that they see value in it. And if you don't include the people in that decision-making process, then I think you're starting off on the wrong foot. <laughs>
Sometimes such initiatives are even started by rural communities. Here in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, the people of Impembeni decided to use their land for ecotourism. The conditions for this seem particularly good here, next to the famous Shlushluva game reserve. The community owns the land which was used for hunting before, and they thought that they want to save it. And they started the negotiations with the park, and the park agreed it took them almost 10 years to agree on that. Then after that, the community had the plan to start the lodge, and the, after the lodge was built, they incorporated their concession into the park and the capital to start the lodge. They got it from the National Empowerment Fund. So the community are the main shareholders in here. This way, the most powerful predator indirectly benefits from the state program for economic empowerment. Safari tourism is supposed to provide a common future pathway for both the wild animals and the humans. It is said that once you're infected with the wildlife virus, you can't get rid of it. Apparently, you can get addicted to such encounters with animals, perhaps because some of these main actors in the wildlife arena are particularly elusive. It speaks for itself when a guide says that he sees a leopard every two months. But obviously, one always hopes one will succeed at some point. Zebras and giraffes also have a lot to offer, not only in their display of hierarchic encounters. The Big Five are undisputedly at the top of the tourists' popularity scale, even though this name for buffaloes, elephants, rhinos, leopards and lions comes from a dark epoch of safari tourism. Hunting these most dangerous animals was considered the only true test of courage among wide big game hunters. Poaching, on the other hand, is triggered by the international demand of animal products. Most of our animals are in danger in terms of poaching and everything. And because the community now is involved, and 95% of the staff that are working here from the community. So they feel they own everything here. So the community is having their committee, which is making the awareness of conservation in terms of the cats, in terms of the rhinos and everything. So they're educating the communities themselves as to how to conserve the animals. you can immediately tell the difference. Where animals are hunted legally or illegally, they flee in panic from people and cars. This definitely isn't the case in the Schluschluwe game reserve. It's no longer about hunting trophies like having a lion's head on the wall, but about finding and filming or taking pictures of these animals. This seems like a kind of trophy in a modern sense, only that the animal doesn't lose its life. The fun search the animal game for the best social media trophy starts at sunrise and ends when the ranger decides it's time to return. The most impressive thing was the first encounter with the lions. It was almost dark when our driver was told that five lions had been spotted, but in a certain distance from our location. He then decided at short notice that he still wanted to drive us there. 
These five lions were lying there in the grass in the spotlight. But what impressed me the most was the proximity of the vehicle to the animals. I had the feeling that if the lion got up and stretched out his paw, he would touch my face. Responsible tourism needs well-trained rangers and guides. The red filters in front of the headlights protect the eyes of the cats and make it possible to observe their natural behavior. The protection of wild animals for tourist purposes depends on the overall package. The Pinda Game Reserve in KwaZulu-Natal has provided a kind of blueprint for similar projects after it was established in 1991. I think in most people's minds, wildlife looks after itself and we never have to do anything to help it or to, to manage it in any way. But in reality, what actually happens is when you put fences around conservation areas, it you know, doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is, what you've immediately done is you've created a management area. Um, so any natural migration routes or natural uh, predator tendencies are quite often cut off. One of the most important things we look for is to maintain genetic diversity and disease tolerance. So a lot of people's management in conservation areas is trying to make sure that the animals are maintain a natural home. Sometimes hunting farms try to give themselves an eco-tourist look. Lions are bred there for the infamous canned hunting. This reduces the professed nature conservation to absurdity. history in this country, the lion business was, a, was big money. Lions breed very fast, they breed prolifically actually, um, given the right circumstances. But as a result of that, there's a lot of inbreeding. Real wildlife reserves like Pinda try to avoid just that, even if they have to put lions under house arrest for a while. There is a management forum within South Africa where you can put the word out and people will then respond to say whether they are interested in your male lions and maybe we can do a swap, you will swap mine for yours. This brings some hardship for the kings of the animal kingdom, but it serves to replenish the gene pool. One of the aspects that, that a lot of people don't see is the process involved in moving large predators from one area to another. In most cases, the ideal situation would be to have a holding facility on both sides. The reason for that is to make sure that they are in physically good health, make sure that they're feeding efficiently and feeding enough, and they can actually feed under artificial circumstances, because that's what it is. Lions never look a gift Niala in the mouth. The real concern remains the conservation of the wild species. In South Africa, there are about 2,000 wild lions, but an estimated 5,000 that live in captivity. The costly resettlement programs are even more urgent for cheetahs. The first cheetah for the Kwandwe Game Reserve also came from Pinda. Pinda has become a very important genetic source for cheetah and they are in demand all over the country and in, into Africa as well. And we've successfully moved cheetah into Central Africa, lion as well. The habitat of cheetahs in Africa has shrunk even more than that of lions. It is only one-tenth of its previous size. So eventually those two males will be moved from Pinda and we'll get another two males in just so that they avoid inbreeding as much as possible. An African child, African child. Cheetahs are in a more dire situation, to be honest. One of their biggest problems is the genetic bottleneck that they're in. There's not a lot of cheetah left in the world. Also, there's not a lot of genetically diverse cheetah left in the world. We're trying to strengthen the gene pool by moving cheetahs around quite a lot. We've had a, a lot of inbreeding because there were very few animals, but now because we can relocate, 
from one area to a completely different area, they're definitely getting stronger and stronger in their population numbers as well as the genetics that we have in the population. If at all, one should only be confident regionally, especially in South Africa. On a global level, as everybody is aware, the amount of range left for big cats is limited. The human-wildlife conflict issue is very intense when it comes to big cats, especially with livestock involved, um, even just human safety, if you want to put it that way. So there are very few places left in the world where big cats can roam outside of protected areas. The lion out of a protected area or conservation area is considered a risk to everybody and everything. But in the reserves, the expenditures for the fight against poachers increased dramatically as well. I would say that 50% to more of our annual operating budget goes towards security and a large Largely that security is focused towards protecting. So it's a financial challenge, it's a physical challenge because of the terrain that the anti-poaching units have to operate. And also the advantage that the poaching syndicates have over us because they can strike any time, anywhere. You can't have your hands and fingers and your eyes on everything all the time. Romantic ideas of wild Africa appear quite out of date. They are based on the beginnings of safari tourism in the early 20th century. At that time, an estimated 120 million people and 200,000 lions lived in Africa. Today, there are 1.3 billion people and only 20,000 lions. It's very hard to not fence of these wild animals because especially big cats because their existence where there's humans is not tolerated because they pose danger the numbers speak for themselves the human population has increased about tenfold in a century while the lion population decreased to a tenth who then is a danger to whom Though there's very, very, very less cases where the lions attack people out in the wild. It's just that looking at them, you have that fear. And uh, so to save them is just to put the fences around, just to say, okay, this is the border where us humans, we sort of not allowed to. Uh, you can keep yours here and then this is the place for the wild animals. And if you want to shoot them, just get your camera and shoot them with your camera. Look at this now. We're just enjoying to be sharing the same space with them, you know, which is quite amazing. Can switching from a rifle to a camera save the big cats? Or is this a misconception in the face of their possible extinction? On a continent where the population is growing rapidly, the ultimate question is how its population best benefits from the land. Only if the people and not just the global tourism industry benefit from safari tourism, endangered animal species have a chance of survival. Cheetah and the wild dogs are more sort of the endangered species which we've got in the Hogan Park. So the numbers are very low due to their habitat destruction and also some diseases coming to and there's only about 120 cheetahs within a space of about 2 million hectares. So you can imagine, it's just literally like a, a haystack, you know, trying to find a needle, which is very, very hard. But there are sort of projects which are actually got involved to try and restore the cheetah's existence. So they put in GPS collars to monitor their movement and then by tracking on the movement why this one's is not moving for a couple of days and then they will go and check at the location. Also if there's any sort of injury.
The Kruger National Park is South Africa's oldest and by far largest protected area. Around a tenth of the world's lion population lives here. Therefore, the Kruger is of global importance for the conservation of species. Currently, ecologists are very concerned about the spread of bovine tuberculosis. You can imagine that these lions, you know, they will take down buffaloes. And because of the bovine TB that the buffaloes carry, that actually can infect the lions as well because they've bacteria stays into the lungs and then that's where they start eating and uh, it was a very very big 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 problem um, for the lions in the Kruger Park and the other one which is the feline immunodeficiency virus which is actually that slows them down as well this so-called feline AIDS is just another reason why lions are officially classified as endangered species Private wildlife reserves like Royal Malevane increase their chances of survival. Furthermore, their ecological integration into the Greater Kruger National Park after the end of apartheid had a positive effect on the seasonal migration of their prey. While the lion populations in southern Africa have increased slightly, in some countries of West and Central Africa, they have recently become extinct. The lack of political stability and indifference by some state governments towards tourism often lead to over-exploitation of nature. I've been doing this for 24 years and guiding is a passion of mine. In the 24 years I've studied that black dam pride very, very carefully. We're now on the fifth generation of lioness, who's the matriarch. In that 24 years, 50% of Africa's lions have been wiped out. So in this small space of time, we've lost so many lions in areas that aren't protected, where conservation isn't happening. In large parts of Africa, effective protection of species fails due to funding. The complex protection of lions and rhinos benefits all other species too, because it is inseparably linked to the preservation of the habitats. Lions occurred in areas through from Cape Town all the way through to the centre, the east, right the way up the whole of East Africa, even in West Africa. You had lions in desert terrain, you had lions all over. Now most of them are gone, so we've just got pockets. Whether a spot of land is preserved is not only decided on site. People in the centers of power and economy must also show responsibility. It is important that these people don't only invest their money in real estate, shares or modern art, but also in nature conservation projects. Whether it's out of love for animals or in connection with economic interest seems to be of secondary importance. I think that our bush in South Africa will always be important to um, the environment and to the world because of the wonderful uh, range of animals that we have there. Um, not only the cats, but the rhino that we're trying so hard to protect. And I think it's a differentiating factor in the world that we have this incredible wildlife. And if we look after it now and save it for our children and for their children, it will just keep Africa going. Luxury tourism and the private wildlife reserves on the edge of the Kruger Park reduces the threat of poaching and creates many jobs. Photo safaris with all amenities require more staff than hunting tourism. Mm. 
one lucky thing in South Africa is lots of land that was hunting turned to conservation, turned to protection, turned to ecotourism. That's been fantastic. I think tourism is conservation. It's the modern way to conserve because you're not going to just have blocks of land for conservation and no one's doing anything because then there's no awareness, there's no real protection. So what happens when you have tourism, you find there's protection. The chief ranger of Royal Malewane is one of only three master trackers in South Africa that are still alive today. Only the most experienced and qualified rangers are awarded this honorary title. Over the years, he's become a pragmatist. For him, tourism presents no end in itself, but rather a means to an end. Experience taught Juan Pinto that modern man only preserves whatever is useful to him. Predatory animals play a special part here. It's of critical importance. If we lose our predators, you lose nature. You're cutting a key part of the circle. Whether it's lions or sharks or eagles or just... You, you mustn't lose the predators because that keeps a balance. In this respect, buffaloes and other herbivores are dependent on the preservation of their natural enemies. When the top of the food chain is missing, the natural cycle breaks down. The big cats are important, but the preservation of another balance is also crucial. Local communities is part of conservation. If you're not uplifting local communities, you're not uplifting your conservation. Conservation is people and animals. Conservation is not animals, animals, animals. Conservation is everything. It's a holistic thing. We want to conserve our planet. So if we want to conserve our planet, we must conserve our people. This correlation cannot be emphasized strongly enough. Whoever wants to watch leopards and lions during the night in photo wildlife cruises needs to take the people into account who prepare a five-course gourmet menu at the same time, maybe even in the middle of the bush. Most employees who proudly present their Shangan's culture are mothers and fathers too. Their faces might reflect their knowledge that their families are well looked after. Our last stop in the north of Kruger National Park is particularly progressive in this respect. Here the Makuleke community owns the land and has signed a contract with the Kruger National Park to include their land in conservation. The Makuleki Contractor Park remains one of the wildest areas in southern Africa, certainly within the greater Kruger National Park. So it's all about sustaining these pristine wildlife areas that we have, and there aren't too many of them left. In this remote place, the outposts lodge employees are only able to attend church service on their days off, which is why they start every morning with a sung prayer. Without any tourists, for their own well-being, and last but not least, for team building. The 
Makaleki community felt that conservation, leaving this area as a prime wildlife uh, area, was more important than converting it into something that possibly could have generated more income. And that, for me, is, is critical, that that decision was made. So as the tourism grows within the Makuleki Contractual Park, there are going to be greater financial benefits. The economic side of it is quite important. During apartheid, the Makuleka only knew the negative sides of nature conservation. Their former land was only accessible to whites. The very first time that I entered Kruger Park was when I got the employment. <laughs> and um, obviously then people used to live on, on hunting for food. But since we got the land back, people are much more educated to know that you have to conserve nature to have it so that the tourists can come in and, and have something to see. So it has changed most of the people's perspective and it has opened our eyes. The anger about these times has mostly subsided. In 1998, the Makuleka received their land back, 30 years after it was forcefully taken from them. It's a success of the land restitution process under Nelson Mandela, to whom bird expert Samuel Japana indirectly owes his job. The yellow bill oxpecker, they eat ticks. They are helping a lot to take ticks from the animals. Sometimes when the animal is wounded, they drink the blood. Other people say they are cleaning the wound so that the bacteria cannot continue destroying that animal. So they are helping a lot. Qualified jobs such as guides and rangers are important in rural areas with chronic underemployment. The community benefits from tourism revenues in several ways, through levies, profit sharing and job creation. Samuel Japani is a wonderful example of uh, someone who was able to lift himself up. Now he's a specialist, he knows more about birds than uh, most people in Southern Africa. We now have people that will uh, travel from all over the world just to come and spend time with them. Before his amazing career, Samuel owned a donkey cart with which he transported goods for a small fee. One day I started getting worried because my life was not changing in six years. Then I went to sleep, then it came to me as a dream with a lot of questions. How could you change your life? So I didn't find the answer by the time. I slept once more. In the morning, when the sun rise, it raised with the answer. It was saying, if you can learn birds, you could change your life. So I approached the Makuleke CPA about my dream. So they ended up by advertising two posts of guides. So I wrote through my application letter. I was competing with young stars aged 25. They ended up by choosing me. I was 46 by the time. Up to so far, I can say my life is completely changed after I became a bird specialist. Yeah, life is going on. Out comes the sun shining on my face again. Ah. amazing because I'm looking forward every time to wake up and see this beautiful place yeah perhaps only a few lucky people like Bonga or Samuel enjoyed this privilege but as long as local communities are willing to share their land with wild animals we can all at least dream of better days Lions are an iconic animal, so if we don't use an iconic animal to conserve and protect, 
what are we going to do? We don't have something to leverage off. And the lion is an ideal animal to leverage off because people want to see lions. At the moment, it looks as if the wildcats will disappear from Earth in this century. But resignation is not a means of coping with the future. South Africa provides an example for a successful, united struggle. Even if it sometimes seems like a lifeline, which cheetahs and lions are clinging on to.